It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Stephen Coles um, from Letterform Archive out in San Francisco. And as it happens, Rob Saunders, who is the founder of Letterform Archive, is will, with us as well. You may have seen him out at his table outside already. Um, you already know from this about uh, roughly what Stephen is going to talk about and his impressive background. In, uh, in design and in journalism and in typography. Uh, one of the things they do regularly at Letterform Archive is to uh, present exhibitions drawn almost exclusively from the collection each time. And also for the more major collection uh, exhibits rather, they uh, produce a high resolution scan and high resolution printed book of very great quality. The um, subject today is going to be a, the recent exhibit called Strike Through, which covered exactly our topic, which is graphics uh, of protest organizations and movements and, and, uh, and of, all, of all sorts. And it's a wonderful book, and it's a wonderful presentation, I'm sure. I've seen the exhibit. I have the book. Um, it's, it's really interesting, excellent stuff. So with that, Stephen. I did want to, no, come. What, this, this man is amazing in, in a number of ways, but one, one of the ways is that he knows and can immediately identify virtually any type font from, uh, you know, uh, Victorian, before Victorian, all the way through all the different eras up until to the stuff that's coming out of the type foundries today. So. He is uh, more than an expert on uh, fonts and typography. Thanks. It's just a party trick. Um, thank you so much, Stick. And uh, thank you uh, to the organization for the invitation, to uh, Barbara for putting up with my late delivery of 5,000 slides. Uh, don't worry, I've cut some of those. Um, but it's a joy to attend my uh, first uh, Femora Society event. And um, first I want to talk to you a little bit about what Letterform Archive is. It's hard to describe sometimes because we're both a library and a museum, and we're also a school, and we're also a publisher. Um, and all of those things are all kind of centered around this collection that Rob has uh, started and now has quadrupled, quintupled many times since. Um, but what we do primarily is give access to this collection. And before I go on any further, he's going to pass out these little brochures to you all so that you get a sense of who we are. Um, and, and what this collection is is a um, focus on letter forms. It's in the name. And the beauty of that is that it allows us to have this very broad scope in terms of history, material, um, style, uh, and um, content. And so, you know, this is a, a typical kind of introduction table. We do these tabletop tours for students, for design teams, for uh, anybody curious about design. And it can have anything from a medieval manuscript uh, uh, produced around the time of the Gutenberg Bible to a Gutenberg Bible leaf to artist books uh, to a cuneiform tablet to uh, type specimens and psychedelic posters and wood type and uh, the speedball textbooks and the original archives of the speedball company. And besides doing these tours, what we try to do is publish books that represent the collection for those who don't have access to it. So again, being the goal of radical access, we call it, we try to document as much as we can. We try to ha provide hands-on access as much as we can. We also try to publish books that really represent the collection as best as we can. So uh, these are very well produced uh, uh, books that, that show the collection. This is the first of our facsimile series on uh, Die Fleche, which was a periodical of the Vienna Secession. Um, 
And then our other newest book uh, is The Complete Commercial Artist, which is this incredible 24 volume set that was published in Japan in 1928 and uh, to 30, uh, basically documenting what was going on in modern design at that time, both in Japan and in the West. Uh, and this really interesting interplay between the two hemispheres. Uh, and um, it includes storefronts, signage, advertising, uh, typography, all the kind of stuff that I know all of you are interested in. So if you would like to get a sense of what was going on in Japan in, in that time, it's a, it's a really good overview. Um, but what do we have in the collection in terms of ephemera? Uh, there have always been some, uh, some major uh, key collections uh, that were ephemeral. Uh, one of them is this amazing uh, 1930s packaging by Jakob Jongert for the Vanilla Coffee, Tea, and Tobacco Company. Um, another is a set of hand-painted uh, labels for the Lehman Label Company that was uh, headquartered in San Francisco. Uh, what we have are basically comps, client uh, uh, presentation comps that are hand-painted. Uh, we have these delightful mid-century transit passes from Milwaukee. Um, there's an article on our uh, blog, uh, more about these if you'd like to learn more. But we've never had a really broad overview of ephemera from before the 20th century, that is until now. Uh, and if you've uh, you know, read in your newsletter, you know that uh, a major collection from Dick Sheaf is uh, on its way to the archive over 26,000 items of ephemera. Uh, and so for us, this is one of the most significant. Yes, please. This is one of the most significant additions to our collection since we, since we were founded in 2015. Uh, and uh, we're really grateful that Dick found it, us to be a good home uh, for the material because our goal, again, is to provide access and to allow as many people to see this amazing work as possible. So there'll be more about this. There's a blog post on our site where you can read a, a, an introduction to it. Uh, there's a little bit in the, in the uh, newsletter that was just passed out. Uh, but there'll be more to come. And we've started already putting uh, some of this uh, collection in our online archive. And the online archive is, uh, it's different than a lot of um, library and museum uh, uh, digital collections you've seen probably because it's trying to give as much focus to the material as possible, to get out of the way with all of the kind of cruft and UI that a lot of these systems have and just focus on the imagery and allow you to get a sense of the size of things. Everything is kind of to relative scale so that you understand that one thing is bigger than the other and to get really high resolution images uh, as you zoom in. Uh, but that's not the focus uh, of the talk today. I just wanted to give you that intro because I know that Dick is an important part of this community and this is such an important part of our collection now. But I'm here to talk about uh, Strike Through, which is the exhibition that ran in our gallery in 2022 and 23. Um, we have a little tiny dual box of a gallery uh, and this was primarily a poster show, so you can imagine how packed it was. The beauty of our uh, the way that the gallery is set up is like most graphic design, it was not intended to be framed. Graphic design was intended to be seen in everyday life and right next to other objects of graphic design. And so the way that we uh, display the work is uh, through steel panels, magnets, and um, uh, these, these uh, polycarbonate uh, glazing so that you can get this kind of density of seeing graphic design in the wild, and which is especially appropriate for the kind of work that we were showing for strike through. Um, Strike Through, I have to mention, was curated primarily by Silas Monroe, who I'm standing with here. Uh, a super amazing curator and uh, designer and an incredible educator. And he works in Los Angeles and he has a uh, firm called Polymode. And we invited Silas to come to the archive and uh, think about what in our collection could represent a protest show. Uh, and he started that process way back in 2019. Um, but what we learned and what we learned through successive events is that our collection did not represent uh, protests in the way it needed to. Uh, it didn't represent this really significant part of graphic design history. Uh, and so what became, what was going to be a 
collection, you know, a, a selection from our existing collection became a curatorial project. And he helped us bring in a lot of important work and also introduce us to uh, new artists, uh, even in our own community, which we needed to be much more aware of. Uh, so I'm going to take you through a quick overview of, of some of my favorite ephemeral things from uh, the show, and it's going to be fast. I'm not spending a lot of time doing deep uh, stories on each of these. I really encourage you to get the book if you can to, to get more into it, but I wanted to give you, uh, I want you to be able to see a lot of stuff. Uh, so our earliest works in the show and catalog are letterpress uh, broadsides. Um, large notices with printing on one side usually. Uh, they were a key tool for abolitionists. Their ubiquity in the streets made them pivotal in shifting public opinion leading up to the Civil War. And this print here, for example, decries the story of Anthony Burns, who escaped from bondage in Virginia only to be arrested in Boston and re-enslaved. Abolitionists rioted and raised funds to buy back his freedom. Mainly printed with wood type, which was lighter and cheaper at large sizes than metal type, 19th century broadsides typically feature an eclectic mix of loud and decorative styles. It's one of the reasons I love them so much. A hallmark of 19th century printing was also the use of metal or woodcut illustrations, which were repurposed between print jobs just like type was. Uh, for news stories and broadsides that address slavery, these artworks called cuts proved problematic uh, imagery for a black press determined to represent its community in its own terms. And this amazing broadside is actually a uh, selection of these problematic images created by a black press. And the, the biting commentary in here is it's, it's humorous, it's also devastating, and it's a really fascinating artifact of design history. Um, and you can see this item here uh, where uh, the Anti-Slavery Society uh, has, has basically uh, taken this runaway uh, uh, enslaved person with a bindle in tow. Uh, and the text laments that the cuts are, quote, uh, even put by masters into the hands of slaves to print with. And that image has been reused many times in uh, design history. More than 150 years later, black art director Archie Boston repurposed one of these cuts in a typographic timeline of racial epithets. Typefaces that were popular across US history spell out the names, often slurs, used by white people to describe black Americans during each era. Jim Crow uh, is a typeface being used for that first uh, word and you go down the line and there are other typefaces that were common in each period and those words that were common in those periods. Uh, I know that Corey's going to cover some great stuff about LGBTQ rights, uh, but I, I threw this in uh, because I think it's such a wonderful piece of design. Uh, considered one of the first, if not the first, uh, queer magazines in the United States, uh, one is just this lovely little piece of mid-century modernism. Um, it was designed by Joan Corbin, a lesbian who also served on its editorial board. And it has a logo in this typeface called 20th Century. So here's a little identification of typefaces. I can't get away from that. Uh, it's an American version of Futura, essentially. Um, and these covers showcase uh, this kind of um, clever abstraction of what were inside each magazine. Um, and, and one of the things that I love about the covers, though, is that they're often self-referential. So you see this one on the right. Uh, it's actually a letter to uh, the magazine or about the magazine from some detractor that says six reasons why your little magazine won't last. It did last several years after this. Uh, you have another one here, are homosexuals reds? So speaking of self-referential covers, the last one here refers to the fact that one was briefly banned by the US Postal Service under obscenity laws. And if we zoom in here, you see um, uh, your August issue was late because the postal authorities in Washington and Los Angeles had it under a microscope. They studied it carefully from the 2nd until the 18th of September and finally decided that there was nothing obscene, lewd, or lascivious in it. They allowed it to continue on its way. We have found suitable, we have been found suitable for mailing. 
So one of the things I want to talk about in terms of typography and what's important about uh, this period that a lot of the uh, strike through collection or ex exhibition represents is what made it possible for independent publishers, and we heard about this with the high school publications a little bit uh, earlier today, what made it possible for all of this work to be done in the volume that it was done when we get into the 1960s. And it's, uh, typographically at least, it's really a coalescing of these three technologies. You have phototype, Letraset, and the IBM Selectric typewriter. Um, and to give you a sense of what kind of volume of interesting material was produced, this is a, a table from our we, we did a, uh, sem a seminar uh, for the Master's of Fine Arts uh, at the California College of Arts nearby, and each week the students would come and learn about an era of history through a table uh, of material. And this is our table for the 60s and 70s, and you can see the uh, variety and color, and a lot of it is independent publishing. And a major part of it also is um, you know, the, the production uh, materials and tools that were used. So phototype is essentially taking what used to be printed with physical metal type and essentially uh, uh, casting type with light because you're going through a negative onto a photosensitive paper and then reproducing that. Uh, and uh, there were all sorts of different phototype machines. This is the photo lettering machine, which was kind of proprietary, but it gives you a sense of uh, what was essentially kind of a one letter at, at a time process initially. And of course, later on, what phototype offered are all these ways to skew and morph and stretch and do all sorts of terrible things to type that I also terribly love uh, in some ways. Uh, and uh, but the, the key thing here is that you are no longer bound to letterpress type, which has a body and a physical uh, barrier, uh, and you could now overlap type. You could choose the kind of uh, negative spacing that you wanted to have. You weren't tied to a baseline in the same way that letterpress printing was. And the other part of this that's, that's key is the advance of, uh, of uh, photostat cameras or stat cams which would um, allow easier enlargement, reduction, reproduction, and creating plates for printing. So the second technology here, uh, commonly called Letraset, but that is uh, a, a brand name, so like Kleenex, uh, but uh, there were many companies producing this. It's, it's often called press type or dry transfer type. Um, but Letraset was, um, as you can see here in this, the center of the tables and sheets, it was essentially the most democratic way to set type because it was so, so cheap. Uh, still can buy letter set sheets today. And um, really, it is the simplest way to apply pre-made letters to a surface. And then finally, the IBM Selectric typewriter, which people don't often think of as a kind of a, a design production tool, uh, but it was really key in making independent publications feel professional. Uh, because the advantage of the Selectric was that you had these changeable font elements, or golf balls, as they were commonly called. And, um, and that meant that you could now print uh, in all sorts of typefaces just using a typewriter. So you didn't need to have uh, you know, a letterpress and metal type and all these different styles. You now had kind of a little mini uh, press there on your desktop. And so this, uh, it may not be easy to see, but uh, that brochure is showing uh, the many different uh, type styles available there, uh, as well as in that advertisement. And one of the designers who was incredibly capable at using all of these tools I just talked about was Emery Douglas, who was uh, uh, essentially the minister of culture of the Black Panther Party. Uh, but his main role was to uh, design uh, lay out and uh, illustrate the Black Panther newspaper, which was um, the voice of this organization for many years. He was responsible from its beginning up until about 1973-72. And uh, so you can see him using primary letter set here on the covers of each uh, newspaper. The newspaper went on to become one of the most circulated newspapers in the world. There were many different accounts of different amounts, and I don't know the exact numbers, but it was more than most major city newspapers by its height. 
And you can see him using Letraset here in a very slapdash way. You can see under the word pigs a little line, uh, and that was because he didn't cut out the edge of the line that helps you align the baseline. Because what he would do with Letraset, uh, he would buy Format, which is the cheaper brand, and he wouldn't actually rub it down because he wanted to save it. He didn't want to spend the money on multiple sheets. And so he would just place it, take the photo, and then reuse the letters later. So often you would see these uh, underlines. But what this is is a function of how this organization was on the run from the law. They were producing these in people's homes. Uh, the FBI, for a certain amount of time, actually knew what colors they were going to be printing with before they took it to the printer because they had infiltration in all of the organization. So they were constantly on the run while trying to produce uh, a newspaper on a, a weekly basis. The other thing he made great use of was these uh, transfer sheets. So it's another, it's the same medium as Letraset, but essentially you have these patterns and it allows you to create these nice big fields of, of pattern and texture. And so even though he was printing uh, in two colors primarily, it's usually black and one other color for every issue of the newspaper, he could add all of this texture and detail uh, you know, cheaply by using these transfer sheets. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this particular piece has uh, 10 or 11 different uh, textures being used. This one, I, I you know, the, later on as, as they got away from trying to address what was going on in terms of police brutality and in, uh, 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 inequality and the state of, of uh, the black population in, in San Francisco and throughout the country, um, they also started to talk about uh, income inequality. And uh, he uh, frequently would feature photo montage in his um, work, but here I think is one of his uh, best pieces where he's taking all these logos from these companies that have then been formed into a hand that is essentially controlling uh, the President of the United States. And you can see here in the speech bubble, that's IBM Selectric typewriter. So another genre of publication that benefited from these technologies was the underground presses of the 1960s and 70s, which covered topics that mainstream newspapers would not. These usually were printed on cheap newsprint and used hand-drawn illustrations, rub-down lettering, as we talked about, the typewriters, uh, and photo reproduction. And these all offered these low-budget means to production because if you can imagine, if you want to publish a magazine or a newspaper, you need advertising. Well, it's hard to get advertising when you're not the dominant uh, kind of uh, culture, or at least uh, the way that the uh, companies would like to be associated with. And so it meant you need to do it on the cheap, and that's what was really powerful about these, these production uh, techniques. So the Oracle was one of the most famous of these, and that uh, was published in San Francisco. A lot of really famous psychedelic uh, artists uh, were featured in there. I think this lettering here, which is not by Rick Griffin, was probably inspired by him. He was a, a famous uh, Fillmore uh, artist. And one really amazing, you know, there's all sorts of amazing stories to be found in these, new, these newspapers, but uh, one of them is, is to, to recognize that this just wasn't just a San Francisco phenomenon. It wasn't just a hippie uh, phenomenon. It was about finding a place for people who felt like they didn't have one. It was about publishing things that they felt like there was nowhere else to be published. Uh, so in this case, uh, and I'll just read it to you, and what this, this woman is doing is she's using the, the, the lettering style from Alfred Roller uh, that was inspiring Wes Wilson and other psychedelic artists. And she's essentially sent in a letter to the editor, uh, but illustrated it in this incredible style. And it says, Dear Oracle, are you still there? Or were you swallowed up in last summer's plastic deluge? There's no life nowhere in Boise, Idaho. If Haight-Ashbury still lives, I'm coming. Does anyone need a bass player who's a chick? Also sings and does artwork, etc. I am Theo Hardy, 120 Horizon Drive, Boise, Idaho, and I love you. And the wonderful thing about this little story is that she made it. Theodora Hardy Rowe grew up in Boise before living in the San Francisco Bay Area during the summer of love. She married Alan Rowe, December 19th, 1971. And during this time, she worked as a graphic designer and played bass and sang in a rock band. And the Oracle ended with its uh, 12th issue, but there were many copycats. And this is one from uh, that sprouted up in LA. 
And this particular copy has a mailing letter label to someone you may uh, recognize, and that's Hunter S. Thompson. Um, it is uh, Al Farm property in Colorado. And there's a label there that says, Love Sample. And I'm assuming this is a complimentary copy uh, from uh, what was uh, this, the, the source of these was from a uh, uh, independent press uh, newsstand in the Netherlands, of all places. And that's where a lot of these in our collection came from. Inexpensive publishing techniques also enabled ragtag publications that couldn't possibly exist in the stone lithography and letterpress days. Uh, this one is an incredible, our, our youngest uh, uh, artist that's featured in the exhibition. Uh, and that was one of the occupants of Alcatraz Island during uh, the American Indian occupation in 1969. Uh, and they had a newsletter and it included all sorts of information about uh, those who were living on the island, but also uh, protest graphics. And this is a woodcut or a lino cut uh, by, uh, by this young artist, Elvin Willie. And here's a radical newsletter without letters at all. So this is Mirta Dermasaj, who is an Argentine artist whose work regularly features uh, what we call acemic writing, writing that looks like it could have linguistically uh, meaning means something, uh, but it's really just mimicking written forms. So this uh, project was her commentary on the Trelu massacre, the Argentine military's 1972 murder of 16 political prisoners. She translated a newspaper into her uh, signature acemic writing, calligraphically obscuring some text in resistance to the government's misrepresentation of the massacre in the media. And the folded copies uh, she left on public benches as part of this uh, exhibition were destroyed by the police in an effort to censor criticism. So in a strange bit of irony, this work, uh, you know, ended up being, uh, you know, it's a, talking about censorship and it ended up being censored itself. Now a couple of examples of rally or protest signs from the show. Um, I love uh, the lettering in this one. Uh, this is, you know, a, an essential, essentially a celebration of natural black hairstyles, which at this time was becoming much more uh, common, much more acceptable, and a kind of a source of power for the black movement. And uh, so it's celebrated right here in the, in the typography. And, and for the catalog, our publisher Lucy Parker found the perfect image of this sign in use at a Black Panther Party rally in San Francisco. Another sign, and this goes along with the suffragette uh, conversation, uh, is a brilliant piece of design. Um, although it was designed in the 70s, uh, the battle for its namesake, the Equal Rights Amendment, actually began in 1923 when the bill was first presented to Congress. Fast forward nearly 50 years later when second wave feminists reintroduced and passed the RA in the House and Senate, although it still has yet to be ratified. The sign appeared in the rallying, rallying cry of 38 states to ratify the bill and make it a constitutional amendment. The sign's creator, a young woman who was volunteering for the, car, the cause, but whose name has since been lost, had no experience in design, but her concept was simple and well executed. A green circle to counter the red octagon used by the Stop ERA campaign. And the other beautiful thing about this design is its ergonomic. If you think about when you're going to a protest and you want to hold up a large sign, you often have to hold it with two hands or have a stick. The idea with a circle is you could hold it with one hand. You could be holding your partner or a loved one or whoever else next to you and still be holding your sign up. Since its invention in 1896, the political button as we know it has been used to proclaim just about everything. Its lineage extends back 100 years earlier when British ceramicist Josiah Wedgwood produced a medallion depicting an enslaved black man reading, am I not a man and a brother for the abolitionist cause. Today, the pin serves as a conversation starter for a host of issues, thanks in part to cheap tabletop button makers. So again, a production technique that allowed more and more people to uh, produce uh, ephemera. And uh, one of the things I love about the button, and again, as the circle shape is it 
it basically this constraint brings about all sorts of creativity. So how do you fill this canvas or how do you uh, wrap the, the words around it, like in the Deaf Pride uh, example here? Um, uh, or how do you use, reuse the circle as a design element? So out now uh, for uh, the anti-war movement and how that circle is repeated both in the typeface in the O, in the P sign, and then in that uh, uh, period at the end. So this patch uh, features the German language version of Anne Lund's internationally popular 1975 design protesting nuclear power. And there was an interesting uh, uh, statement made earlier about uh, the suffragette movement and how um, there was this idea of color and also what will women wear to protest. And actually Anne Lund talks about she wanted to make something that just looked good that people wanted to wear <laughs> uh, when they were protesting. And she was not, again, a trained designer, but this um, can sometimes yield the best uh, results. And the simplicity of the layout and recogniz recognizability of this uh, sun uh, symbol in the middle meant that it could be easily localized. So uh, all that had to be done then was change the text that was surrounding uh, this, this sun or burst in the center. And so it quickly spread and uh, was adopted in more than 30 languages. Uh, fabric patches became omnipresent in countercultural movements starting in the 1960s, functioning as both a fashion choice and an overt political statement that signaled solidarity. Uh, this selection here, all from the 80s, uh, demonstrates a shift from the flowery embroidered patches of the hippie generation to the proudly lo-fi, inexpertly screen printed aesthetic of the punk scene. Stapled, sewn, and safety pinned to jackets and jeans, the patches became an emblem of a social political identity that rejected capitalism or oppression. And speaking of capitalism, uh, the last two moments uh, from the 21st century now, uh, this was in support of the Occupy Wall Street movement that emerged from the 2008 mortgage crisis and ever widening income disparity. Uh, Ivan Cash and Andy Dow, uh, I happen to know Ivan, I met him at a protest. <laughs> Uh, he devised a set of stamps that repurpose bills as economic infographics. So here you see in this chart, um, basically uh, a comparison, it's an area chart. It's a comparison of average CEO pay, the entirety of the dollar bill, with the average worker pay in that red square in the corner. And that was in, that was in 2011, so it's different now. Uh, not only did they distribute the bills, but they also distributed the stamps too. And that passed the power along to, of the press, along to anybody uh, with the time and the willpower. And another uh, here, splitting the bill in half to show that the richest 400 Americans own as much wealth as the bottom 150 million. Again, the facts are even more eye-dropping today. And for my last example, uh, an international one, uh, this was for the Occupy Central uh, Umbrella Movement of 2014 in Hong Kong. Uh, calligrapher and designer Kitman, uh, which is a pseudonym, created energetic brush pin images such as this one, which says no withdrawal of the extradition bill, which was essentially no withdrawal of the protesters. Um, and this was distributed online as, as a digital document. So a different kind of uh, a way of, of distributing a, a graphic for others to then print in whatever way they had, uh, whatever possibility they had to then uh, pass along. So they could pass along uh, digitally or print it, bring it to protests, create signs. Uh, he later uh, converted his uh, handwriting into a font, which raised 740 thousand uh, dollars, uh, Hong Kong dollars, from more than 900 backers. And unfortunately, Kitman uh, was arrested sometime during the protest. Uh, and I haven't heard from uh, him since uh, when he gave us permission to include his work in the exhibition. So uh, this is the book here. And uh, I invite you to, to check it out when you're um, out, outside uh, in the lobby. Uh, just to give you a quick uh, run through, we, we structured the show in these five kind of chants that you might hear at a protest, uh, and these became themes for the show. Um, 
And it starts with a curatorial statement from Silas, uh, who I mentioned before. And one of the things that was really, uh, this was a very humbling experience for me because there was only so much that I could understand about a lot of this content. He's a black queer man and he knew from his own personal experience a lot better than I did for a lot of this work. So uh, it's, it was crucial that, uh, that he led the book and led the curatorial process. There's a great uh, essay by Colette Gator uh, about uh, demanding black liberation with typography. And then I wrote a thing kind of summarizing what I've talked to you about today about how typography has uh, power in a lot of these documents and the kind of tools and techniques you get into other things such as stencils and uh, cut paper and other ways of making. So that is what I have for you today. Thank you so much. I wish that we had some of those abolitionists' broadsides. Uh, those, uh, uh, the two that we had were uh, borrowed from the Library of Congress. So almost everything in the show is, in, is from the collection, but those were not. There's a really amazing collection at the Boston Public Library as well. Uh, other things, um, you know, I was really fascinated with the high school um, uh, press work. Uh, and I think it's amazing that some of that was saved. I imagine I was surprised how many were printed in some cases, but I would love to have more work by younger designers. I think that would be amazing. And there's a, you know, there's a thing that goes back to art, but when young people produce work, uh, they often are not colored by art class or what, how the existing design structures are. And they create work that's really remarkable because they're coming straight from their gut, you know, so there's often really interesting work from young people that I'd love to have. Yeah. Have you started collecting uh, pieces like these or related to these at protests that are going on now? And how do you go about doing that? Are you going to the event and asking people for the material when they're finished with it at the end of the day? Or can you tell a little bit about the collecting going forward for protest? Part? That is a really super good question. Um, there was an initiative from uh, I'm sorry, the question was, was that, you asked me to repeat it? Or no? Yeah. Okay, uh, the question was, are you collecting from current uh, protests? How would you uh, gather what's going on today in the world? So there was an initiative uh, during the uh, protest following the murder of, of George Floyd by a poster house as, as people were going out into the streets and, and they asked, send your work to us when you, when you feel it's appropriate. I think that's an interesting way to do it. Uh, in our show, and I don't know if you saw it at the beginning, uh, it would take some time to get back to it, but um, what, we, uh, what I did the day after the, well, the week after, and there was a lot of protests going on in Oakland, was try to get as much photography as I could, uh, because a lot of that work is so ephemeral. It was, there were uh, boarded up buildings all uh, downtown Oakland, and there were also commissioned murals, many of which only lasted a couple of weeks. Uh, so I took as many photos as I could, and, and one of the most striking ones, which is included in the um, uh, kind of the intro projection uh, in the gallery when you came into the show, uh, was um, as I was walking down the street, uh, I saw uh, a bed sheet hanging from someone's porch, uh, and they had just used black tape uh, to write out the words Black Lives Matter, and they put on the bed sheet, and it was it was just hanging there and and swaying very gently in the breeze and I just thought that is a powerful, like whatever materials you have, if you've got to make a statement, you can make them. I mean, that's a beautiful thing of lettering is you, you know, as long as you have some kind of tool to make a mark, you can make it. So uh, that was a really powerful one to me. Uh, and I think some of these things sadly can only be captured with photography, but um, we should be thinking about what's going on with current protests and, um, and gathering them. There's one here and one up there. Thank you very much. Um, so can some, some of the, uh, 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 um, go back to your comment about the high school uh, ephemera, can some of those original handwritings, those, those 
I would consider that typography as well. Can that become font officially? Can you t could you take that that one of those things, you know, that was examples and make a font out of that and make that like an official font? Does that happen normally? Yes, actually, I'm glad you brought that up because a piece I didn't show was actually um, this uh, series called A Queer Year of Love Letters that was created by Nat Piper. And what he did is he plunged in through the archives of, of uh, gay uh, liberation ephemera and took what are the most interesting to him lettering and handwriting samples and created digital fonts out of them. And then he distribute those di digital fonts, uh, similar to what Kit Kitman did with his uh, uh, digital distribution of his protest calligraphy. So yeah, you can make fonts out of just about everything. Uh, and we actually have a type design program at, at Letter from Archives. You can come and learn how to do it yourself there. <laughs> Here's one here or here? Here. Uh, yeah, the scope and significance of this collection is just mind blowing. And maybe it's just my lack of information, but can it be that there's not been a similar collection formed uh, here or in other countries? But I, I wonder to follow up on that, uh, looking at the significance of this exhibition, do you have a lineup of uh, exhibitions in mind that your uh, collection can support? Yeah, um, great question. I mean, they're definitely great. Like the Interference Archive, which we heard about from uh, earlier that has the, the high school uh, press work is really amazing. It has primarily protest work. There are other great um, archives of protest graphics. There are also other great archives of um, graphic work uh, and graphic design in a sense, but there aren't that many places that have the focus we have, which is on graphic design from all periods. Usually when you see graphic design, it's in a fine art museum, and usually their focus is fine art. So you'll see a little room once in a while with some graphic design in it. Or it'll be at an architecture or a product design museum, and then again, it's second shrift to the other stuff. So there aren't that many places that solely focus on graphic design, um, but there are some, some good ones nearby. The Lou Ballin uh, Study Center in uh, New York is a really great one to visit. Um, nearby. Um, and in terms of other exhibitions, we have, uh, uh, right now there's an exhibition of Jack Stoffaker, who was a local uh, letterpress printer, did these incredible wood type prints that's up in our uh, gallery currently. And the next show uh, does have a lot to do with this one. In fact, his work is, is uh, uh, included in Strike Through, and that is Amos Kennedy Jr., who is another amazing letterpress printer and does this uh, work with uh, overlapping text. Uh, and Often he'll use uh, messages of social justice or or just humorous messages. He's just an amazing, brilliant, warm, funny guy and uh, has these incredible wood type prints uh, that we're really excited to show and publish a book about very soon. Thanks, My, Stephen. Oh, um, I appreciate it. Thank you. Time.